Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Spotlight Oral Care to prepare you for the inevitable battering Halloween candy will do to your teeth. Man, you should really brush your teeth more because that is not normal. After the explosive climax of 2020, it's going to be survival of the fittest out there. And while everyone is using those generic low-powered supermarket toothbrushes, pfft, I know, amateurs, am I right? You're going to be one of the chosen few to use Spotlight Oral Care's multi-setting sonic toothbrush to fight back against sensitivity, plaque, discoloration, cannibalism, and worst of them all, bad breath. And maybe scurvy, who knows, the night is still young. Currently, it's thanks to Spotlight's clinically proven, harm-free, vegan-friendly toothpaste, combined with the Sonic Toothbrush's deep cleaning technology, and even a cheeky wee setting for those on the sensitive side of things, that your friendly neighborhood clown is able to keep those teeth nice and sharp for devouring all those pesky, disease-ridden children. <laughs> what, children are made of plants, right? And look, I know what you're thinking, I want to blind my enemies with sparkling white teeth. Well, that's exactly what Spotlight's teeth whitening system is here to do, with their toxic free strips that, as a child who ate way too many sweets, and as an adult who drinks way too much coffee, I find to actually work. So if, like me, you want to improve your dental hygiene, ease sensitivity, and just want the sexy looking sonic toothbrush that'll make you the cool kid at the party, you can join the Spotlight community today and get 25% off your first order by clicking the link below and using my code to achieve divine dental enlightenment. Seriously, after watching The Road in the context of 2020, I will never take my teeth for granted again. Anyway, on to the video. guidelines all ghosts and goblins should follow always stay on sidewalks never go to a stranger's house and never go out alone <laughs> Michael Dougherty's Trick or Treat is a work of sheer joyful genius. Not only is it one-off, if not the greatest horror anthologies of all time, but its devilish tongue-in-cheek celebration of the Halloween season is relentlessly rewatchable. I pick up on something new every time I see it, and its meticulous interconnected storylines are delivered in such an effortless fashion that it's filled with constant surprises and satisfying payoffs that are both exciting and deeply arse-clenching, but we'll come back to that one later. The premise is simple. On Halloween night, several neighbours of a small fictional town in Ohio each experience a thematically different horror scenario that all end up connected in some way or another through the eerie, mysterious presence of a trick-or-treater called Sam. It's a short, sweet, efficiently told, and easily digestible horror flick, and I've even seen a few people describe it as a solid gateway into the horror genre because it has a bit of everything to it, from creature feature to slasher to the supernatural to even its heavy use of iconography and symbology. This was a film that was done dirty by its distribution, because it never received a theatrical release and instead ended up touring festivals and hosting a few select screenings for two years, before finally making its way straight to home video, without having a chance to make an impression on the mainstream. Sure, it may have been a bit too niche for conventional audiences, but who's to say the character of Sam didn't have the potential to have the same iconic status as Annabelle, literally one of the most soul-sucking, boringly wooden modern horror icons currently out there. Regardless, Trick or Treat obtained a considerably strong cult following across many horror circles, and eventually led to the just as brilliant Christmas horror Krampus, a Joe Dante-inspired celebration of seasonal morality that maintained all the same humour, heart, and quirky scares. So, let's put this into context. Trick or Treat is essentially a morality play that uses the Gaelic festivities of Samhain as the basis for each parable, a tradition that symbolised the end of the harvest season and the start of the darker half of the year where the threshold between the living world and the spirit world was at its closest. As such, Halloween night has an air of superstition and vulnerability to it, where the souls of the dead are said to roam the streets, causing mischief and fear as the locals perform symbolic rituals to appease and suppress said spirits. 
The central catalyst to the story's supernatural shenanigans is the destruction of neighborhood jack-o'-lanterns caused by the fat kid who managed to escape Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. As tradition states, jack-o'-lanterns were believed to ward off evil or act as a protection spell, and once they were destroyed or the candle was blown out, evil was given a free invitation to invade your home. It's a clever little setup to explain why these specific characters are the ones being targeted by Sam, but at the same time, some of them have pretty valid reasons to be deserving of their comeuppance. The film opens with a genuinely disturbing, if comically grotesque murder that sets the complex tone of the story. On the one hand, it has a cheeky, pulp-like sense of humour, but on the other hand, there's a deep-seated nastiness to it that stops you from becoming completely desensitised to its violence. It's certainly a challenging hybrid to pull off, but Mike Doherty navigates it brilliantly by focusing so much on characterization and incorporating the audience's point of view into the morality of the story that it has a way of toying with your emotions. For example, it makes you feel sorry for certain characters during their inevitable mean-spirited doom, while other times it throws some wildly unpredictable emotional curveballs that change the context of each story, but obviously that involves going into spoilers, so you've been warned. The first story involves the local principal Stephen Wilkins killing the fat kid destroying jack-o'-lanterns with poison candy and burying his body in the backyard. It gives you the film's first real taste that not everything is as it seems, and good luck trying to identify who or what is actually trustworthy, because everybody is fair game for the slaughter here. As soon after he viciously buries the kid, your natural instinct is to think, oh god, he's going to kill his own son, but nope, it turns out he's actually training his own son to be a killer as well. It's a fun twist to really consolidate the preceding sense of deception, the trick so to speak, that works in tandem with the treat of deliciously violent consequences for basically being a dick. I suppose you could say the film is influenced by a lot of iconic horror movies like Halloween and Gremlins and so on, but I actually think it's more of a homage to anthologies in general. In fact, I'm not just talking about Creepshow and Tales from the Crypt, which have a very obvious influence on the comic book aesthetic, I'm talking about kids' horror anthologies, like Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark, and most specifically, The Simpsons Treehouse of horror. I say this because all the characters in the film feel like deviations of traditional sitcom characters, like how The Simpsons would subvert their characters' traits and personalities to make them fit appropriately into specific parodies for Treehouse of Horror. For example, you've got your Principal Skinner, Ned Flanders, your Ralph Nelson, your Lisa, your Marge, your Maggie, and so on. The entire cast just fit perfectly into typical sitcom character tropes on a comical level. Hell, if you were to remove the horror elements altogether, you're left with the skeletal foundation of any traditional Fox, NBC, CBS style comedy series. I think what reinforces this is how seemingly out of character everyone is, once it's revealed who they actually are. As I said, Doherty spends so much time on building archetypical characters and implanting a feeling of deception that the twists have a sort of fun gotcha quality to it. But venturing further into the other stories, we have the high school bus massacre where a bratty girl tells her friends the story about a bus of mentally challenged kids falling into a quarry, killing everyone except the bus driver. And now she and her friends are bringing jack-o'-lanterns to the site of the massacre as an offering to appease the spirits. However, it turns out that their real goal was to scare the awkward quiet girl that they reluctantly invited along, and soon they realised that the spirits of the deceased children were real this entire time, prompting the timid girl to leave them all behind to be torn apart as she holds the only jack-o'-lantern to stay lit, calling upon its protective powers. 
It does try and make you feel kinda bad for the one kid who regrets his actions, but it makes it clear that this isn't a film about forgiveness, but rather unquestionable punishment. There are no second chances. It's the antithesis of Christmas, where peace and harmony can be found once a year. Halloween is a season purely about fear. Huh, that rhymed. I think my favourite story is the Red Riding Hood setup, which has recurring scenes throughout the film that deliberately ease you into the tension of a lonely girl called Lori looking for a plus one to bring to her sister's party, only to be stalked by a vampire. It has an absolutely incredible twist where the vampire following her isn't actually a vampire, thus firstly making you think, oh shit, she's obviously the vampire, but then quickly does her costume make the most literal ironic sense when she and her friends turn out to be fucking werewolves, looking not for boyfriends, but prey. Oh, and uh, who exactly is this mysterious wannabe vampire? Well, it was actually the principal from the first story, who earlier told his son that he had to get ready for a date. When I said earlier in the video that it has this efficiently told story, this is what I mean. It has a payoff for every detail it gives you. Nothing is wasted. In fact, the high school bus massacre isn't finished yet and you'll soon see why. Now really, the big dramatic reveal in this scene is discovering what the hell Sam actually is, and to this day, I'm not entirely sure what to think of it, so uh, you know the usual, brace your arse cheeks. <laughs> So it's basically an aborted pumpkin head, but one of the weird things about it is once you get used to it, it's kind of adorable. I mean, that says more about me than Doherty's fucked up imagination, but stylistically I guess its deformed, obscure quality is indicative of the Halloween spirit. It's a hybrid of horror, a cute abomination designed to teach you a lesson you'll never forget, and in the case of Logan Roy, it seems seems to be appeased by candy, a treat that protects him from being tricked. But of course, as I said, it's not a story about forgiveness, because as Sam leaves, the old man is confronted by the deceased children from the bus massacre because he was that very bus driver, and as the children attack him, we're once again reminded that in the world of evil and trickery, there are no second chances. And so that concludes Trick or Treat. I made this video simply as a light refreshing cooldown from all the grim depressing topics I've covered throughout the year, but this isn't the end just yet, it was merely a breather. So send me your future requests in the comments below and prepare once again to enter the madness very soon. Happy Halloween, stay safe, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.